Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Welcome to Conversations. This is the, the second edition in the special uh, Ramadan 2024 series in which I'm uh, basically introducing to you a book from classical Islamic thought, uh, which I think is one of the gems of Islamic uh, intellectual heritage. So in the first episode, we talked about Muhaddima, the book written by uh, the great uh, Muslim thinker Ibn Khaldun. For our next book, uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, the Islamic Community Center of Lancaster for co-hosting this event. Uh, the, uh, and also <laughs> a couple of Khans, Wasim Khan and Raza Khan, for buying these books for me. Uh, these are expensive books, and I really appreciate the fact that they have sent this to me. Uh, so the next book that I want to talk about is, uh, the book in Arabic is called Fasl al-Maqal by the great Islamic uh, philosopher, thinker, jurist, and also a medical doctor, uh, Ibn Rushd. So Ibn Rushd lived more or less in the 12th century. He died in uh, 1198. Uh, and I remember 800 years uh, of his death anniversary. I was in the United States studying, uh, doing my PhD in international relations uh, and Islamic political thought at Georgetown University. And I remember writing an essay for the Islamic Horizon, the magazine, about Ibn Rushd, his ideas and uh, his uh, work and his impact. Ibn Rushd is considered as one of the fathers of the modern Renaissance. His books uh, and his philosophical work and his scientific work has had a huge impact on Europe in, uh, during the Renaissance. In fact, Ibn Rushd contributed in uh, basically uh, you could say three broad areas in the arena of philosophy, in, in the arena of medicine, and also in Islamic law. Uh, so his book on Bitaayat uh, al-Mujtahid, uh, which is about the, the differences in Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudential schools, uh, has had a, is an important book written by a Maliki scholar. Uh, Ibn Rush was judge of Seville and then later Cordoba for nearly 10 years. He was very close to the caliphs in Spain and uh, he advised them regularly on legal and philosophical matters. His book on medicine, he was also a court physician for many years. His book called Kuliyat uh, Fitib, uh, this book uh, was taught in medical schools in Europe for several centuries and in fact in some universities in Latin America, it was taught until the 19th century for nearly six, 700 years. Imagine uh, how in complicated and sophisticated the quality of that book was. Kuliyat uh, Fitib. There are many articles about Ibn Rushd's impact uh, on Enlightenment thinking, primarily because of his commentaries on Aristotle. So Ibn Rushd wrote commentaries on all books written by Aristotle, except politics, which he did not have. He, he, he wrote on uh, various books written by Aristotle, including Plato's uh, Republic. And he wrote three levels of commentary, short commentaries, intermediate level, and those long exegetical style commentaries, which uh, commented line by line by line. And those who are students of Ibn Rush's philosophical contributions argue that there is a lot of original thought in the long commentaries uh, of uh, Aristotle. So basically, many Muslim scholars and most European scholars understood and studied Aristotle through Ibn Rushd and his commentaries. And there are huge uh, discussions. Uh, Thomas Aquinas spent a lot of uh, time criticizing and agreeing and disagreeing with Ibn Rushd now, on many other issues, including something that became very famous in Europe called the double truth theory, which I think is a misunderstanding of Ibn Rushd. So Ibn Rushd has a huge impact in the West. Unfortunately, his impact in the Muslim world was not as much because there is an antipathy to uh, intellectual thought, to scientific research, to philosophical thinking in the Muslim world. And uh, the ulama and the religious scholars often uh, would declare people who were... Uh, moving away from consensus uh, as heretical, and that was always uh, yeah, something scary. So we all are familiar with what happened to Mansur al-Hallaj. And so this, this violent uh, 
streak with which uh, sometimes Muslim scholars who tended to, to disagree with the broad consensus uh, among the religious scholars uh, uh, caused a lot of problems. So anyway, Fasl al-Makhal is a very, very important book. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And I think that all of you should read it. American Muslims should, should actually buy this book. Uh, it is uh, it is a very interesting edition by uh, the by uh, the the university in Utah, Brigham Brigham Young University. They have produced several classics from the Islamic heritage in translation. And what I like about uh, these books are uh, I, I sometimes use passages from this for my graduate students and including <laughs> conducting exams uh, uh, on a couple of occasions for PhD students who needed to get. Uh, to pass Arabic exams. Uh, so, so it has Arabic on one side, as you can see, and English on the other. So you can read, the, if you can, then you can read both the original text, uh, as well as you can then go ahead and read his translation. This is Charles Butterworth's translation. Uh, Charles is a very good friend of mine. He was on conversations uh, talking about Al-Farabi. Uh, I will post a link to that video. You can see it. Uh, after this, if you like. But before we talk about Fasl al-Makhal and what it tried to do and why it's very important, uh, uh, I, I want to give a context to it. So after Ghazali wrote a book called Tahafat al-Falasafa, that is the incoherence of philosophers, there was basically an attempt to delegitimize the study of philosophy and even logic. Uh, even Ibn Taymiyyah, a prominent Salafi scholar, <laughs> criticized uh, logic and wrote a treatise on logic, which was actually quite uh, logical uh, in its uh, style, actually. Uh, but uh, anyway, so so there was this whole debate going on, especially in the Western part uh, of the Islamic world, especially in Andalusia in Spain, about the role and importance and permissibility of philosophy. And so Ibn, uh, Ibn Rush essentially responded to to Al-Ghazali by writing a book called uh, Tahafat al-Tahafat. So Al-Ghazali wrote this book called Tahafat al-Philosopha. Uh, I might do a review of that. I actually uh, did a huge summary of that discussion as part of my dissertation. So in Tahafat al-Philosopha, Al-Ghazali basically criticized philosophers and especially targeted them on their, on their metaphysical uh, theories uh, and basically uh, essentially said that they were leaving the fold of Islam because they were disagreeing with the consensus on issues of uh, whether God has knowledge of particulars or not, and so on. So basically, the philosophical position on the omniscience of God varied from the theological position. And so Ghazali was very critical of it. And so he basically wrote this book called The Incoherence of Philosophy. Uh, and then Ibn Rushd responded by writing a book called Incoherence of the Incoherence, uh, in which he, he rebuts uh, Al-Ghazali line by line. So I realized after I bought Tahafat, Al-Tahafat, this is the one, that you don't need to buy uh, Tahafat al philosopher because if you buy Ibn Rushd, then you get both the books, because he actually quotes Ghazali verbatim and then he said so everywhere it goes Ghazali says I say Ghazali says I say that's how the whole book proceeds I guess that is Ibn Rushd's style his commentaries on Aristotle are also like that line by line the way Muslim scholars actually wrote exegesis of the Quran so coming to Fasl al-Maqal this book it's a very short book he is trying to say is that Kitab Fasl al-Maqal this is like a decisive treatise final statement uh, that uh, basically uh, connects and looks at the connection or harmony uh, between philosophy uh, and, and law and Islamic law. So in the book, there's a lot of discussion about many things. It's a very short manuscript, but there are three things I think that Ibn Rushd tried to accomplish in Fasl al-Makhal. First, he wanted to make the argument uh, that philosophy is not something un-Islamic outside the fold. And so he says that the purpose of writing this book, Fasl al-Makhal, is to answer the question whether the study of philosophy is forbidden, permitted, or commanded. So is it haram, or is it halal, or is it something that is fard? It is something that God has 
demanded that you do. So, for example, uh, God has forbidden that you drink alcohol or eat pork. That is haram. God has permitted you to marry. So it is halal. But God has not commanded you to permit. God has commanded you to fast in the month of Ramadan. That is what. So in his answer, basically, he's putting philosophy in that category, that it is a command from God uh, that we uh, basically uh, learn and practice philosophy. And how does he do that? The way he does it is very simple, uh, and I will get to that. So that's the first thing. He answers this question, uh, whether philosophy is prohibited, permitted, or commanded. The second thing that he tries to do is tries to explain the philosophical method of thinking as to what it is and why it is okay and why it's not very different from legal thinking uh, and uh, basically trying to argue that the philosophical method is just a sister of the, the legalistic uh, jurisprudential thinking. In fact, if you, are, if you basically study law, you will realize that while fiqh, which is particular legal rulings, uh, may not be so, but Usul al uh, which is essentially epistemology, uh, is, is a philosophical exercise. And the third thing he tries to do is basically to argue as to why philosophers uh, should not be excommunicated and why they are not heretics because they are practicing philosophy. So what he does is he uses what is called as syllogistic uh, argumentation, where you make uh, two kinds of statements, and it follows. So, so for example, uh, it's like saying uh, men are always tall, and since uh, Khan is a man, Khan must be tall, or Khan is tall. So that kind of logic is called syllogistic logic. Uh, so, so basically, what Ibn Rushd does is it takes many examples from the Quran uh, and. Uh, basically shows that the Quran is commanding uh, the believer to reflect on the creation, or, or on the signs of God, uh, and basically saying that these are uh, these artifacts that you see uh, are reflections of the artisan. So the signs of God are essentially reflections of God himself. And so trying to understand these things are something that the Quran really commands. And the purpose of philosophy is to understand the world, to reflect upon the world, to know about the world. Uh, and so he goes on to cite several verses from the Quran. Uh, and uh, he does cite uh, the verse 191 from chapter 3. And I was when I was reading this the first time, I was wondering whether he would cite it or not. And to me, it was very meaningful because I consider these two verses, the 190th verse and the 191st verse, as very important from an epistemological point in the Quran, and I will explain to you why. So, so basically, he talks. He looks at one verse, uh, which is uh, the second verse of chapter fifty-nine, in which talks about ulul al absar, people of vision, and people of reason, and people of thought, and people of understanding. So he picks verses from the Quran like that uh, to basically imply that they are essentially philosophers. So in this verse that that I am going to point out to you, uh, the, the he doesn't cite 190, he just cites 191, uh, in which he is basically saying that uh, 191 is, in my opinion, a definition of the phrase ulul al absar, uh, sorry, ulul al bab. Uh, so in the previous verse in 190, it says, in nafi layli wa nahari li al bab. So what the verse is saying, he says, indeed in the creation of heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and day, there are signs for those of understanding. So basically it's saying that people who think, people who reflect, people who have knowledge, people who have understanding, they can see this, this day and night, uh, this, uh, the creation, the heavens, the knowable world and the unknown. Uh, they look at it and they can understand. There are signs for them to understand. So it's basically saying that people who are ulul al-bab are capable of inferring things from what they observe. And that is the scientific method. And so the next verse, which Ibn Rush does cite, is, in my opinion, essentially a commentary and an explanation of who are these ulul al-bab, who are these people of understanding. 
and it says bismillah alladhina yaskuruna allaha qiyama wa qudan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard so that is the key part is who remember allah while standing or sitting or lying on the side and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth who do fiqh wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard those who reflect upon the heavens and the earth So to me, this verse is very important because this verse describes Ulul al-Babs as those who are philosophical as well as mystical, because they remember God all the time. They're doing zikr of Allah all the time. Who remember Allah while standing, sitting, or lying on their side? Uh, if you were to ask Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi would probably tell you that Ibn Rushd would miss the first part of it because he was so focused. on justifying the philosopher and the philosophical method that he would miss the first part alladhina yaskuruna allaha qiyama wa qudan wa ala junubihim but focus on yatafakkuruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard so they, they reflect on the heavens and the earth so he takes verses like this and makes the argument that clearly clearly the quran has commanded the islamic law the sharia commands that we try to understand the world by observing is, is the signs that are out there in fact there are enough verses uh, uh, while writing uh, islam and good governance i had compiled over 170 verses uh, from the quran i actually have a list somewhere which uh, makes make these kind of commandments uh, which uh, so from there you can see Uh, god is talking about historical reasoning so so look at the history extract and infer conclusions from history about what god is trying to communicate with us so look at history look at uh, the celestial being look at the space uh, look at the mountains and the rivers look at the change in day and night and in seasons etc so there are a clear encouragement to god uh, by god to focus Uh, on on empirical historical as well as rational way of thinking and that is what philosophy is and since the law commands you to study philosophy philosophy and law cannot be in disharmony and therefore within islamic tradition islam and philosophy is therefore in a state of harmony and then he goes on to try and explain what the islamic way of thinking there are several words he uses uh one word is obviously hikma hikma is often translated uh, to mean falsafa or philosophy uh but you must understand that ibn rushd was aristotelian unlike al farabi who was platonic so al farabi's method was deductive reasoning so he would move from the abstracts to the particulars whereas uh, ibn rushd was aristotelian and that's why there is a polemical manuscript that ibn rushd wrote uh, criticizing farabi and even ibn sina so and then you move from uh, the specifics and particulars to to essentially theory building which is the aristotelian method Uh, and you take particularities of phenomena of things much more seriously property then that's why you go into categorization that's how science emerges without aristotle we won't have the scientific method or the empirical method uh with with plato comes the philosophical method you know, to a great extent uh so so he, while discussing these methods i noticed that some translators often translated uh some of the words that he was using such as al qiyas al aqli as uh, syllogistic thinking or intellectual syllogism that's how charles butterworth uh, uh, translates and i think that when they use such uh, syllogism has a very specific uh, form of logical thinking today uh but i think qiyas has a really broader meaning even though in islamic legal practice it means analogical thinking uh and uh but uh, i i think what ibn rushd was trying to do was essentially making the case for the methods for hikma uh, and so he was basically arguing uh, when he was trying to defend what he called uh, uh al qiyas al aqli is uh, an intellectual way of thinking uh, about the signs of god about the nature and the world yes philosophy has evolved today we have postmodern philosophies 
uh, and uh, deconstruction, archaeology of things and so on and so forth, Foucault and Derrida have had huge impact uh, on the, the evolution of philosophy. And I'm not very sure whether Ibn Rushd would uh, embrace them as hikmah or even al-qiyas al-akhali. But nevertheless, I think what Ibn Rushd in, in his discussions, in his methods, was basically defending uh, not only rational thought uh, and rational reasoning from the deductive thinking point of view, but he was also uh, making a case for empirical and scientific thinking. I think we are doing a disservice by translating his work as essentially showing a harmony between just uh, law and philosophy or between Islamic law and philosophy. But I, I think what Ibn Rushd was doing was trying to show the that not only is it compatible, but God has commanded Muslims to be scientific in their way of thinking, to be rational in their way of thinking, to be philosophical in their way of thinking. And I think that is why this book is so important. Uh, the West has benefited more from first al maqal and the arguments that Ibn Rushd has done uh, than, than unfortunately the Muslim world. And you can see the state of science in the Muslim world reflects that. Uh, I, I was reading, Ibn Arabi's uh, account of of how he potentially, you know, he met Ibn Rushd only once, but he also saw his body, and he noticed that he he died in in Morocco, in Marrakesh, and he was brought and buried in Cordoba, in Spain, and he was brought on a beast of burden. <laughs> and one side was his body, and on the other side were, were his books, which were used to balance him. And apparently he was buried with his books because there was a faction among the traditions who were against the study of philosophy, against the study of science, uh, uh, metaphysics, uh, and logic uh, in the Muslim world. <laughs> they wrote books against logic. Uh, the third part was basically a defense of philosophers. And, and the, the logic is very simple that God has commanded people to indulge in philosophical thinking. And so when a philosopher speculates, he does not uh, essentially violate the law, so he should not be excommunicated, even when his findings uh, are not uh, consistent with the consensus that existed prior. Otherwise, what is the point of doing independent thinking, right, if you are not looking for alternative ways and, and expanding what is uh, ijma or in the consensus. In the book, he also identifies three modes of discourse and thinking. So he says that there are three modes of thinking. One is the most common way of thinking, which is uh, is kataba. It's like uh, it's like a, a, a rhetorical discourse, which is often employed uh, by preachers. Uh, and teachers uh, of religion. Uh, so poetry is part of it, the rhetoric uh, is part of it. Uh, and so these are khataba, you just like giving it a discourse, uh, which is very rhetorical. The second way of thinking and speaking is dialectical, he calls it jadal. And uh, that is what he argues is what theologians use. Uh, they look at things from very much different perspectives. Uh, and then he says the highest form of uh, thinking and speaking, highest form of highest mode is Bohan, which is where he comes back to his original concept uh, of uh, uh, al-qiyas al-akhali is, is essentially uh, necessary because it leads to uh, a logical philosophical uh, discourse. So rational uh, exposition of things, uh, so putting things together uh, and inferring things together using your reason and then uh, elucidating them. That is Burhan and he says that is what philosophers do. So this is an important book, even though it's very short. Uh, and uh, uh, if you get this version of it, you will have both the Arabic as well as the, the English version of it. Uh, um, Charles, if you're going to watch this show, thank you very much for translating it. You did a fantastic job. Uh, so, so this is a great book. Ibn Rushd is a great scholar these days uh, in the Muslim world, uh, which is trying to revive itself, especially in the arena of education. It's very important 
then we go back and look at uh, classics uh, like Muqaddimah, which also emphasize so much on empirical research uh, and rational thinking, uh, and also uh, this book like Faslul Maqal. I have two more books to go uh, in this month of Ramadan, and I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. Uh, I hope you look forward to them. Uh, thank you for watching uh, Conversations. Uh, and uh, if you have enjoyed this, uh, do subscribe to Conversations, uh, like this video, press the bell icon, and don't forget to share it with your sociopolitical network and with your friends, especially students and graduate students uh, who may or may not be directly interested in Islamic philosophy, but are studying the Muslim world or Islamic thought in some other form. Uh, and do, if you find time, definitely read Faslul al -Makal. It is easy for those of you who are here, uh, especially if your uh, main language is English, because there are wonderful translations available out there. So until the next edition of uh, uh, Classic Books, uh, uh, I'll take your leave. I'm your host, Muhtadar Khan.